Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest Detroit Regional Chamber Town Hall session. We're so glad you have taken your valuable time to join us uh, for a conversation that we have not yet had during this COVID period, and that is a conversation about the importance of immigration and how immigration issues have been impacted by the COVID-19 crisis with a special focus on our businesses that are impacted by the closure of the Canadian border. Brad Williams, our Vice President for Government Affairs, will join me in the questioning of uh, Rami Fakori. And uh, Rami is the Managing Director and Founder of Fakori Global Immigration, uh, FGI. And uh, Fakori uh, has been very engaged in the chamber over the years, uh, including serving on the board of our Mish Auto organization, our automotive focused uh, group, because he does an awful lot of work with businesses and a lot of automotive businesses resolving their business related immigration issues. So uh, Rami, thank you so much for joining us. We are, we're pleased to have you, even though we can't see you today. Oh, Rami, are you still with us? Okay. So this is what we call an awkward moment. Uh, Rami was with us just a second ago. Um, and all right, everyone, I apologize for this. Um, Rami, we cannot hear you anymore. Well, Sandy, I still show him uh, on the list. So while we're uh, waiting for a minute uh, to uh, talk to him. Yeah, go ahead, Brad. I, yeah. I'll, be, I'll be coming back. Yeah, hi, can, can everyone hear me now? Yeah, we can. We, I, okay. I just did this wonderful, you know, glowing, flowery introduction of you uh, and, and, and you missed it. Well, thank you so much, Sandy. And again, I apologize for technical difficulty here. Um, but I believe your question goes to the fact that uh, our borders have been closed with Canada and Mexico. Our concern primarily is Canada. Um, obviously, the reason for that was um, COVID-19 and the spread of the virus. And most of the countries around the world have closed their borders and made it far more restrictive. Um, in um, terms in of the US, 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, the um, the uh, the uh, the restriction went into place uh, on March, I believe, 22nd, and will continue through October 21st. Um, in in short, uh, basically, the land border is very restrictive. Um, there are entries into the U.S. of U.S. citizens and green card holders, and uh, workers from uh, Canada and possibly even third countries that are considered essential workers. Now, these are primarily uh, employees that are involved directly with COVID-19, to a certain extent, some medical areas, et cetera, and uh, as we'll discuss later, uh, possibly some infrastructure. But it is much more difficult uh, to enter the United States unless uh, CBP deems that the individual is in the U.S. for essential work, which is a very um, somewhat very narrow, restrictive um, uh, area and primarily deals with medical and infrastructure. Uh, one of the issues, uh, Rami, that uh, Brad deals with a lot uh, is the issue of uh, of the integration of the uh, the Detroit region and the Windsor uh, economy. Uh, can you talk, kind of, you know, outside of this COVID environment, uh, a bit about how integrated these economies are and how reliant both sides of the border are uh, on the flow of talent across the U.S. Canadian border? Absolutely. I, I still believe that we're uh, number one or number two in terms of uh, goods flowing back and forth. Uh, that has not been as hampered as much, but uh, we are considered a super region, even though Windsor is in a separate country. Um, much like San Diego and Tijuana, which have done also a fabulous job, as we are doing a fabulous job, um, the, the movement of uh, people and goods are critical, have been critical for the U.S. government and the Canadian government and our populations for quite some time. Um, there is definitely uh, incredible trade that happens uh, across the border. A lot of uh, Canadians do enter the United States 
for our healthcare industry, um, a lot of nurses, as well as for our automotive industry and many technology related fields as well. So it is very critical and it does have an immediate impact on the economy and uh, uh, companies' ability to, uh, to complete projects, uh, to deliver services, and to stay competitive worldwide. But again, this is a temporary uh, phenomenon which is related to COVID. Um, other super regions within the EU, for instance, um, have been a little bit more lax because of uh, it's, it's more of a, a customs border. But um, in, in short, any emergency services on both sides really are permitted. But uh, the regular flow of commerce and business, unfortunately, has been somewhat disrupted. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you a big picture question, then I'm going to turn uh, over to Brad for the next uh, couple of questions. But uh, let's take a big picture view. Uh, what, uh, obviously, immigration has become a hot topic political issue, but let's set that aside for, for a second, Rami. Uh, what is the importance of uh, immigration to American businesses? Uh, you know, how, how, how is that factored in as a competitive uh, uh, issue or advantage for American businesses? Sure, Sandy. Um, you know, there have been all sorts of studies that have been conducted in terms of entrepreneurs and immigrants. Um, I believe something like 25% of um, uh, small businesses that uh, are uh, functioning in the U.S. have been started by immigrants. Um, and uh, even though immigrants are technically only 15% of our population, if you look at some of the greatest companies in the world that we're lucky to have, for instance, in Silicon Valley, many of them are started by immigrants or uh, children of immigrants. Uh, our graduate schools are uh, filled with many uh, uh, immigrants as well as um, uh, ethnic uh, first, second generation, et cetera. So it is very critical. I think the United States has been built in one of the reasons we are such a great country, I feel, is because of uh, the ability to recruit the best talent in the world and people that are very hungry and innovative and are willing to um, take risks and um, and bring about innovation that we all benefit from. Okay, Brad, do you have a question? Yeah, Rami, um, I, I don't know if you watched the Emmys the other night, uh, but after uh, Schitt's Creek, which is incidentally a great television show, won its seventh Emmy, uh, Jimmy sure. Kimmel suggested that the president is building a wall on the wrong border, uh, that we should be blocking our Emmys in uh, the United States. Um, but what do you suggest for uh, some of our businesses who have Canadian employees who maybe aren't essential, but certainly are in uh, the national interest uh, and so aren't covered under uh, some of the uh, some of the, 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 the provisions that, that allow them to, to work in the United States? Yeah, sure. So specifically for uh, U.S. companies that have Canadian uh, uh, citizens that are employed or were employed in the United States, we can still try to uh, pursue, uh, for instance, a TN visa, which is unique to Canada and, the, and Mexico. Uh, that has not been as restrictive. However, we have been told that um, there have been uh, some uh, attempted border crossings and the uh, CBP did not feel that these individuals were um, essential workers. That happened early on. I think they've loosened up. But I would recommend perhaps uh, uh, flying into the United States, which has been far less restrictive and go through pre-clearance. So the TN visa offers Canadians um, a, a very um, unique road into the United States. There are also options under what they refer to as national interest exemption. And uh, that was recently put into place. And there, uh, for instance, if uh, someone's coming to the United States, of course, with COVID or anything that's infrastructure related or help our economy recover, et cetera, there's a, there's a form in there you have to support social education and a letter from your employer. Uh, but there is a way to uh, at least make the case that this should be in a six, each one of the categories from an uh, ACE which ones, um, all have, uh, or it should be, for instance, which is unskilled, have uh, certain exceptions and criteria. But um, you would need to look at the circumstances of that individual and what they're contributing to the United States and what uh, if their absence from the United States is going to be detrimental to the employer or to some aspect of our economy, I think we can make a pretty uh, cogent argument that they uh, deserve to be entered in the United States. But that is basically 
more or less discretionary uh, uh, with the consulate or the land court, depending on the type of visa that we pursue. And they have wide discretion. So um, we have found that they have loosened up a little bit, but that is a, that's a possibility for employers to pursue. But it's very so fact specific. But in general, um, yeah, please. Yeah, so I think Canada is probably the... In general, my concern is uh, corporations look long-term and... Go ahead, Robin. I think we're, I, th I think the internet is uh, overlapping us a little bit here. So um, I think Canada is the country that probably most of our businesses deal with from an immigration perspective on, on the most regular basis. Entry into the United States for foreign nationals. I mean, what is the, what is the scope of our restrictions? I mean, how many countries are we still dealing with? And what are some of the pro proclamations the president has issued uh, regarding immigration? And how long do how, how long are, are are we looking at right now? What's the what's the the scope of the playing field right now? Sure. Well, just very quickly, I I think there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, right now, a lot of these proclamations will expire December 31st. Um, they may be extended, obviously, if there's a second outbreak and depending on the elections. Um, in terms of uh, other restrictions, there are many countries that have been specifically banned. A lot of those do not really involve probably a lot of business, uh, a lot of it's for national security purposes. Uh, China sort of being added to part of that as well. Um, in terms of the Canadians, um, again, it's really a COVID related situation. For other nationals, depending on national security and for the EU, um, and really the rest of the world, uh, there has been a proclamation that was slapped on, as I mentioned before, H H-1B visas, which would really harm our area. I think we have a good number of them. I think we were number 14 in the country in terms of H-1B work. Interest people of high specialization that are entering the United States to perform a very specific or unique function. Um, so uh, so it, it clearly does, um, impact business and their uh, smooth operations, uh, et cetera. Um, again, it is a worldwide uh, phenomenon, but um, I think that we could have probably been a bit more strategic in terms of how we determine who can come in and at what function. But as I stated, uh, most recently, the administration has provided a pretty wider um, exception uh, and it's really fact specific and uh, you have to go to the consulate and look at it. Um, but I, my concern is the long-term uh, da so-called damage. Corporations plan long-term, and if you look at uh, how well the Toronto area is doing, even prior to COVID, uh, due to restrictionist uh, immigration policies, Toronto, I believe last year, um, added more or created more IT jobs in Silicon Valley. So I would love to see us become a super region within Toronto. Uh, we have a lot of talent, and, and actually the U.S. in many ways is less expensive. Um, so in any event, I, I do feel that uh, uh, the virus, unfortunately, is going to control a lot of this uh, policy that uh, we're seeing. Um, but in general, under the Trump administration, even prior to COVID, we have found more and more restrictive uh, immigration policies for corporations. I'm, I'm, I'm referring to legal immigration here and talent, uh, which I think uh, hopefully will change in the second, uh, uh, if, if, if he's... If, President Trump's reelected, or if a Biden administration is uh, is uh, wins, uh, I think we're going to hopefully see an opening because I really feel that uh, immigration, the free movement of people, capital, and goods, is critical to the United States. Has really made us such a great country, and I I, I really feel that uh, North America, you know, through um, the the new trade uh, treaty agreement, is critical. And if you restrict immigration and the movement of talent, I think that that can really hamper the objectives of the um, uh, the USMCA, uh, the updated NAFTA accord, which we really need to be able to compete as a regional powerhouse. I'm referring as North America's an entire region. And how do our current restrictions kind of line up with where the rest of the globe is as far as opening themselves up to other countries? So how are we? How are our restrictions um, comparable to other other kind of Western industrialized countries? you know, uh, on the, the reopening uh, front. 
Good question. Unfortunately, um, Americans um, have a difficult time traveling to other countries. Um, and, and, you know, and from a scientific or a political point of view, um, many countries have more or less made it very difficult for Americans to travel overseas, which is also a very critical thing for us to conduct our businesses. Um, so I think that um, you really have to look at the nation. Um, for instance, uh, Russia, the U.S., um, Brazil, countries, unfortunately, where the virus has sort of uh, taken off or at least perceived as being uh, less controlled, um, has more or less uh, um, scared certain countries into providing restrictions based on nationality, which I think is very unfortunate. Uh, but, you know, of course, each and every country. So there is still a restrictive policy. Uh, within the EU, I'm sorry, for the EU in general, but within the EU, there's a little bit more movement of, of people, obviously. Um, but uh, I think to, to, um, uh, to make this less political, I think Canadians have more options to travel and work overseas at the moment, <laughs> if that answers your question directly. And I, and I, I think uh, a lot of countries are just concerned with the spread of the virus, et cetera. In terms of the U.S., we have stopped testing uh, for people coming into the United States at our airports. We are not restricted to 15 airports any longer. So, um, so the U.S. has in some ways opened up a bit more, and hopefully we'll see that with other countries in terms of U.S. nationals. Sandy? You're on um, mute, Sandy. Yeah, I was going to say thank you, Brad. Uh, uh, I know you do a lot of work. I know you do a lot of work uh, on the Canadian on the Canadian side, but can you comment a little bit about uh, what's happening down uh, with our border in Mexico? I'm sorry. Yeah, in terms of what's happening in, in Mexico, um, again, uh, similar. Yeah, to yeah. In terms of the, the flow of talent and the issues about uh, 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 U.S. talent going into Mexico. Uh, 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 needed talent uh, from Mexico flowing into the United States. Uh, is it much different than it is uh, with our case in Canada, or are there different issues at play? I think there are different issues. Uh, the ca Canadians have the ability to more or less show up at the port for many of their visa categories. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I think with Mexico City, it's more of a hot spot. So even prior to COVID, Mexican uh, uh, inbound immigration to the U.S. has been more difficult. Uh, it is more difficult at the moment uh, because you have to uh, more or less make an appointment at the consulate and why and uh, depending on the consulate, um, it, it really uh, is difficult to get in for an appointment and you definitely have to prove that you're that you qualify for the, uh, the exemption, uh, which uh, is an added step per se because it's that much more difficult to to go through in terms of TNs, as, for instance, Canadians can just go to uh, different ports. Uh, they don't have to go to the consulate. For Mexicans, you have to go to the consulate. So that adds another layer of complexity. And with the fact that uh, many of the consulates are not uh, fully functional and are very restrictive, um, then um, you know it, it is more complicated to bring in Mexican nationals at the moment uh, and more or less traditionally than it is for Canadians. Um, in terms of U.S. Uh, workers, uh, they, the Mexicans, I believe, have been a little bit more lenient and open to allowing uh, U.S. workers, but again, depending on the category. As we get ready to wrap up here, I've got two questions. Uh, first of all, you work with businesses large and small, but uh, primarily on the large size. What are you seeing your business clients do to adapt uh, to this uh, more restrictive immigration policy, uh, the COVID restrictions on top of that. Uh, how are your clients adapting? Point, I'm just having some minutes. Okay, uh, I, I, hopefully, I'm, uh, you can hear me. Um, a lot of corporations, Sandy, um, I think it's a long term um, you know, investment. When you look at uh, seeking talent and bringing in people that have taken years to acquire critical skills, um, I, you know, they're, they're looking at a pool of, of people from different parts of the world. And um, so corporations, I still feel, will end up going to places where they can find talent. I mean, that, that ex to me, that I think Toronto and Vancouver are two, two examples. I think Germany to a certain extent. Um, and um, I, I think that uh, having a, a robust and an updated immigration policy that reflects the needs of our nation and our corporations 
is critical. Um, otherwise, some of these corporations um, will hire and uh, create offices elsewhere. Uh, we even saw this uh, prior to COVID, uh, for instance, with Microsoft in, um, in Vancouver and other companies going up to the Waterloo area in Toronto, et cetera. Uh, Canada has been actually very dynamic in terms of allowing uh, corporations to bring people in uh, in a much shorter and uh, in many cases, less restrictive manner. Um, and I think as a result, um, you know, more and more corporations are looking at Canada despite uh, unfavorable tax and weather and other issues. Uh, there is clearly a correlation between being friendly uh, in terms of allowing talent and grooming talent and having a good educational system. Well, these are all parts of it um, and, um, and uh, creating jobs. So uh, there's another critical thing that we have to look at too, Sandy, that uh, maybe wasn't asked, but I just want to point out export control laws, um, transfer of uh, knowledge or information that the U.S. government deems um, critical or essential. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, a lot of it is legitimate, of course, uh, for national security purposes. I think you've seen a, um, you know, a crackdown on Chinese nationals. There's clearly espionage. I hope that that, uh, that, 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 does, that doesn't spread to other nationals. Um, I hope that it's, it remains a national security tool, which is critical and does not become more of a protectionist tool. Uh, in terms of what type of workers have access to different information and technologies. Um, you know, ideas need to, uh, I think, foment in terms of a, uh, an area where people can express their thoughts and share information and intelligence. And I think that brings about innovation. And once you restrict that, I think you, you curtail innovation. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I think it's been tried throughout history. It doesn't really work. Um, I think the U.S. still has the lead in technology. I think we do have a serious threat from China, but I don't see how restricting um, bringing in the greatest talent and the smartest people and keeping our students, actually our student population, international student population is down by 25%. Uh, many of these folks end up going into STEAM. So we educate them, or I should say STEM, but I'll add in the arts. We educate them, then there is really no viable path for them to stay here. And um, you know, I've read story after story of PhDs from MIT or um, Caltech or whatever that end up in foreign countries that are competitors of ours because they had no viable way to stay here. So I really hope, and I think the Trump administration has stated that they want to move to more, more towards a merit-based system, uh, whatever that exactly entails. But clearly, um, you know, uh, having a, a workforce that is well-versed in, in uh, the STEM fields is absolutely critical probably i feel i'm biased but probably the most critical piece of any kind of strategy for any corporation because you can have all the greatest ideas in the world you can have uh you know research etc but if you don't have the right people that can execute it and understand it and can build it um how far can you go and corporations uh you know the borders are sort of disappearing i know mean, we have a temporary um a speed bump here but you know ideas flow freely through the internet and so corporations can uh, actually relocate people and can build pools of um, essential workers overseas. And I think that would be a travesty for the U.S. economy, especially for the Detroit region. Um, uh, it, it, sorry to digress here, but I, you know, I feel that we should have more of a liberal open system where we allow people with uh, STEM degrees to actually even receive green cards if they stay in the Detroit area. Help us rebuild our population use uh, the, the brightest minds in the world to, you know, reconstruct our, our economy here and make us a part of a super region of not only, you know, surrounding uh, Midwestern states, but even the whole Toronto area. We can more or less piggyback off of them because they're doing something terribly right. And, uh, you know, and again, I think they have many advantages in terms of uh, cost of living, taxes, et cetera, that we can uh, encourage more companies to come here. So um, I hopefully that answered your question, Sandy. Yeah, no, it uh, it did. And actually, you segued into uh, at least my final question, uh, and that is, so this COVID environment, we are now six months into it, uh, has taught us all to work from home, uh, just like uh, the three of us right now are, are working from home. Obviously, there's limitations uh, sometimes with our internet systems, but with the world uh, far, used, uh, far more used to working from home, how do you think that is going to change how businesses look at uh, talent acquisition? 
Um, you know, are immigration laws and rules going to be more or less important? And how do immigration rules uh, may need to be altered uh, to adapt to this new growing trend of uh, working wherever you sit? Sandy, excellent, excellent question. Uh, a lot of thought leaders are trying to figure this out. In fact, some countries are actually even levying uh, for instance, if you're visiting overseas and you're working and doing emails that considered working in their country, which was never really an issue before. Uh, but you're absolutely right. As, as the human mind. You start to ask themselves, do I really need people here in America? I mean, if you look at what Twitter and Facebook and uh, Amazon are doing, they're, they're hiring people all over the United States now and Canada. Uh, and people can stay in their own home state. So I think that uh, corporations will have far greater opportunities to find talent pools uh, all over the world. And it's going to be a matter of how do you manage that, that information and coordinate uh, workloads. Um, so immigration, um, again, I, I feel that countries that will be more liberal in terms of selecting legal immigration that fits their national needs will benefit, like Canada, for instance. Uh, otherwise, corporations, I think, are going to have more options and they're going to have access to a global workforce uh, that we've never seen in human history without having the need for the person to travel or to live there. Uh, and don't forget, I mean, we have airports so people can come in for quick meetings as well. And for in-person meetings, there are certain restrictions, of course, in terms of what they can or cannot do if they're here. Uh, but um, I think we need to look at immigration as how do we build our talent pool in, in the United States or in the Detroit region to compel companies to uh, have a greater physical presence here and, uh, and to come here and seek out these, uh, these workers. And how do we figure out a way to keep them here instead of them going to Silicon Valley or by? I think we have a very unique opportunity because I think we have so many great things happening uh, for us here in Michigan uh, in terms of cost of living, et cetera. So, uh, you know, it just goes back to, um, you know, a professional basketball or football team. If you can attract the greatest people in the world, well, you're probably going to do pretty well. And if you don't have access to all of these great players, you know, even with great coaching and everything else, I mean, how far can you really go? Um, so, so I think uh, immigration is uh, a strategic initiative. I think the Canadian government and the German governments have both picked up on this. Uh, they have been very open to talented and well-educated people that can add a lot to society. And as a result, I think you see a movement of companies, including American companies, that are doing more and more in these different countries. Because in the end of the at the end of the day, um, we're, I think most countries are going to be experiencing. This is not something you can fix immediately, as you know, Sandy. Uh, you know, th this is, you know, decades of education, um, you know, higher education. There are many areas, of course, in unskilled labor and otherwise. I, I see that as well. And even your basic, uh, you know, um, manufacturing jobs have become advanced and require a lot of training and education. So, um, so I think it's critical to hone in, figure out how we can, um, you know, harvest this talent. And, uh, and we have the greatest benefit in the world because we have so many foreign students that seek uh, you know, to pursue their college education in America and our grad schools. And, uh, you know, by the way, these people add a lot to our economy. They pay three times as much in tuition, you know, tens of billions of dollars to our uh, economy. And I think even in, the, in Michigan, it's uh, yeah, well over a billion. Um, but to make a long story short, I think immigration should um, be an initiative, a strategic initiative to attract the greatest talent pools in the world. Um, I, of course, we have to deal with COVID in the short term. In the long term, uh, there's undoubted, uh, you know, uh, evidence and data and studies that show that countries that allow, and I think if you look at American history, uh, countries that allow immigrants to come in uh, tend to, I think, be more innovative and tend to uh, perform better economically versus closed countries or restrictive countries. Well, that is what they call a true fact, uh, and uh, we share your uh, opinion on that, and that's one of the reasons why uh, legal immigration has been, uh, especially for the high-tech uh, fields, uh, to really protect our automotive uh, and next-generation mobility industries to make sure that our region continues to be a global leader. Uh, we believe immigration is important and the chamber continues to advocate for that. Uh, and uh, Rami, we really appreciate uh, your advice and counsel, uh, especially with our mission program. 
uh, on immigration issues. Uh, we just appreciate your engagement and we really appreciate you spending uh, your valuable time with us. Even though we couldn't see you today, uh, we, got, we got the best of you, which is, uh, which, which is your mind and your, uh, your intellect. So thank you very much. And to our audience who has taken their valuable time to join us. Uh, sorry for our little technical difficulties uh, during this particular session. We apologize, but uh, I'm sure you share uh, your, um, uh, your appreciation uh, for Rami's valuable time. So with that, everyone, thank you. Have a great day. Brad, good to see you as well. We'll Thanks, see everyone Andy. soon. Thank you, Brad. Care of you. Appreciate thank, it. You. thank you. Have a thank nice you. day. Thank you. Thanks for all your work. You well. Thanks. Bye. Bye.